Yes. So in terms of actual guidelines, the American College of Obstetrics Gynecology, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the European Society for Human uh, Reproduction, known as ESHRA, all three of them say that we should only address fibroids if they're causing symptoms. And it's especially because, like I said, nine out of 10 of us have fibroids. And of course, no surgery is without risk. And so if you have no symptoms, a doctor could certainly go in and start taking care of anything they thought shouldn't be around, but that can lead to complications that can then cause you more problems than good. Now, that said, in your case, like I said, that seven centimeter one sounds like it's symptomatic, given that you can actually feel what we call bulk symptoms, right? So you can feel the bulkiness of your uterus when you're ready to empty your bowel. You can right. feel a definite change in the bulk of your abdomen and the uterus once you've emptied your bowel. That is a classic bulk symptom, as we will call it, B-U-L-K. Um, so that would be a reason to address that. But the surgery for that is does involve a cut on your belly, going in and removing it. Healing time, if it's truly subserosal, healing time is six weeks. If it involves the actual wall being in the muscle wall or what we call intramural, um, then you do need to allow the womb to heal a good three months, 12 weeks before you try to get pregnant. Um, so I would say, yes, I agree. Talking to your doctor makes sense. If you don't have one, getting one. Um, talking to one that actually feels comfortable taking care of fibroids. There are now minimally invasive fibroid specialists, meaning they're trained to take care of fibroids without making the big C-section scar. Um, on your belly. And so again, this is specific to fertility preservation. I know I saw a question pop up that says, why is embolization not recommended for one who's in, in possible future pregnancy? And the answer is because the concept and people behind fibroidization is starving the fibroid of blood supply, right? So an embolus means you're throwing off something that's gonna cut off the blood vessel to the fibroid. And if you're someone that actually has a lot of fibroids in particular, as you cut off the blood supply to the fibroid, you're also cutting off blood supply to the surrounding healthy uterine tissue. And so the question is the integrity of the uterus to actually stretch and hold a baby in the future. Um, it increases your risk of things called uterine rupture, which is the spontaneous popping open of your womb while you're pregnant. That is a life and death surgical emergency for mom and baby if it were to happen. Um, there are a number of other issues that could happen, which is the embolization can also shoot off to the ovaries and decrease blood supply to the ovaries, the place that has your eggs. And so you can inadvertently cause your egg number to drop. And of course, for us women, we don't make new eggs. And so if we're not making new eggs and we cut off the blood supply to what we have, you're just losing your eggs faster. And so that's why the recommendation is not to do it. Now, if you've done it because nobody told you and you still want to try to get pregnant, we don't stop you, but we do consider it a high risk pregnancy for the reasons that I just described. And you're followed closely to make sure your pregnancy goes safely. We also had another question coming in. Mm -hmm. that wanted, they wanted to know what type of surgery is recommended. Um, this person has multiple intramural fibroids. Mm -hmm. And we told that their womb is the size of a four-month pregnancy. Yes. So the size of a four month pregnancy or what we would call 16 weeks is large. Um, the route depends on the fibroid sizes and the comfort of your surgeon. So, you know, prior to six years ago, we were really pushing hard to doing what's called robotic assisted laparoscopic myomectomy, which is you ended up with three to four four small incisions on your belly. Each one was about this long. And we connected a robot and we actually robotically excised the fibroids, stitched the womb back up, and then took the fibroid out by basically using what almost looks like a, a blender to core it up, take out smaller pieces. And then unfortunately, there was one very, what we call landmark case here in the United States that actually led to a global recall of the device that cores up or chews up the fibroid known as a morselator. 
And as a result of that, so what was the issue? The issue was that there was one case out of Harvard where a patient who actually was a physician herself um, ended up having surgery on what was deemed to be a fibroid, what was known as a leomyosarcoma, which a cousin of fibroids, but it's a cancer. And so grinding up that fibroid actually led to small pieces of fibroid shoot that well, what wasn't in the end, the tumor shooting across her app and giving her what was a more advanced of her cancer. She ultimately uh, passed away. Her husband, who's also a surgeon there, he um, took it to the level all the way to the Food and Drug Administration saying that if the morselation hadn't happened, it's not the removal of the tumor, but the process that pours it up into smaller pieces to take it out through those tiny incisions. If the morselation hadn't happened, his wife might have been alive um, because she wouldn't have had an upstage to her cancer. So as a result, there was what was called a moratorium placed by the Food and Drug Administration on use of that device known as a morselator. As a result, around the world, right, the companies that make the, made the morselators stopped. So around the world, people doing robotic myomectomy had to regroup and rethink how to do it. And for about four years, no morselation was done. Now people are morselating again. Now they're doing it where the fibroids removed, the tumors removed in your body, the fibroid, it's put into a bag. And then if morselation is happening, it's happening within the bag. So if you... Uh, I just happen to have a piece of bread here. If you imagine this to be the fibroid, then in, within your stomach, they put it into a bag and then the morselator goes in and it chews it up in there and then they pull the bag out instead of just have it fly around as they're chewing it up. So that is still now the recommended, which is laparoscopic myomectomy, but it has to be done by someone who's a skilled surgeon, which is why I recommend going to see a minimally invasive surgeon. This is someone who was trained to do that. Um, most of the people who do that are either minimally invasive or those who are trained like I am because most of the reproductive endocrine and infertility specialists, we also do the same minimally invasive surgery um, for removal of fibroids. So that's one way. The other way is a myomectomy, which is they make an incision around the same place where C-section would be. And they go in, it's an open surgery in that you're asleep. They take out the fibroids and they stitch it by hand. So they're not using any extension, no laparoscope, no robot. There's not something that's extending and functioning as their arms. It's their own hand and fingers doing the work. They stitch the uterus back and then they stitch my clothes and that's the way to remove it. Um, what I tell everyone is it depends on the size of your fibroids, right? So the most fibroids I've removed to date from one woman is 63. I removed 63 fibroids from one woman. She had a uterus that was the size of a 30-week pregnancy, meaning she looked like she was seven and a half months pregnant. Um, her surgery, though, I did have to do an up and down incision, which is I did an incision from just above her pubic bone, a cut up to just under her belly button, so I could really expose the womb out and core out those fibroids safely. Uh, the surgery lasted four hours. It was four hours of getting in and taking out every single one of those fibroids. Um, it's the most I've taken out, but sometimes I don't take out that many. For her, she just had a lot of fibroids, some big, some small, and we worked. Um, I had one I did a couple weeks ago. I took out 12 fibroids. She actually had 13 but I left one because it was growing right where the biggest blood vessel to her womb was. If I went after that fibroid, the chances were 50-50 that I would be successful in removing the fibroid without any difficulty versus ending up in that blood vessel that I would not be able to do anything but take out her womb to save her life. And so I chose to not remove that specific fibroid because I needed her womb to stay intact because starting next week, I'm going to be putting a baby in there to get her pregnant. So that's what I mean about choices. And it's important that you have that conversation with your doctor and for that to be made clear. Um, 
what else was I going to tell you? Oh, sometimes we actually give you medications to shrink the fibroids. So I told you about uh, that woman who I took out 63 fibroids from, right? I took out 63 fibroids, but before I did her surgery for three months, I had her take a certain medication to stop her periods for three reasons. The first reason was when she first came to see me, she was very anemic from all her heavy bleeding and heavy periods. So I wanted her blood counts to rebound and go up nice and high before surgery. Because let's be honest, any surgery does involve some blood loss. Mm -hmm. The second reason is I wanted her to make enough blood so she could donate some blood to herself in the month before her period. I wanted her to do what's known as an autologous blood donation. Um, we do that here in the United States. I happen to know you can do it in Trinidad and Tobago because I've done it for a couple of my patients there when I've operated. But the whole goal is to allow a patient's blood counts to go up enough so that not only does she have a lot of blood in her own system, but we can actually take some from her and freeze it before her surgery so that if the need comes up, that I need to transfuse her during surgery, I'm first going to give her her own blood that I've had her freeze before I do anything else. Of course, that doesn't apply to say a Jehovah's Witness patient for whom they can't even get their own blood back um, that was frozen. For them, I do something special because I do have Jehovah Witness patients as well. But the first thing is to get their blood count nice and high so that even in surgery, if she lost some blood, I'm not having to rush to get a transfusion because she's starting off so nice and high. But if she did lose a lot and I needed to give her a transfusion, I also have some on backup. But the third reason is for the surgery itself. By shrinking the fibroids, it allows me to make a smaller incision or cut on her belly. So like that woman, if I didn't do the three months of the medication to stop her bleeding and shrink the fibroids a bit, I would have had to make a cut that started just under her breastbone, which is known as the xiphoid, all the way down to her um, pubic bone. Oh. So by shrinking the fibroid, I actually facilitated a cosmetically more pleasing um, incision. The one I did 12 weeks ago, she came in with a very big uterus. It was about 20 weeks in size. I gave her the medicine for two months, again, for two reasons um, in her case. One, I wanted to shrink the fibroid more so I could go through more of a small C-section type scar, which is the low one bikini cut. Um, but I also, again, wanted her to store some blood. Now, we didn't end up using the blood that she um, froze for herself. But I wanted that because I try to do autologous blood um, donation for any patient I'm going to do a myomectomy on specifically because it can be a bloody procedure. But again, the way I avoided the need to transfuse her was I made the conscious decision not to remove the one fibroid that was growing right under the biggest blood vessel to her womb. So those are some of the choices I'm talking about. Um, let's speak to Jehovah's Witnesses in case there's a Jehovah's Witness on the line, because I think this is one of the tricky patient groups where they end up with hysterectomies because the doctor's like, well, you're losing a lot of blood and I couldn't transfuse you. So I had to um, take out your uterus. So for my Jehovah's Witness patients, I actually have a conversation before surgery. They're the ones I definitely give that shot two for three months and I get their blood count as nice and high as I can get it. That way, if we're doing the surgery and they start bleeding, I still have a lot of what I call reserve in terms of blood. But the other thing I do is I use a special device in the operating room that actually as they're bleeding, their blood goes through that device, it's filtered and the cells go right back into their body. And so we do that for our Jehovah's Witness patients. Um, that way we are actively recycling their blood without it actually leaving their body permanently. It's just we form a continuous circuit to, um, to help them do that. So that's what that is. As uh, someone just said, um, what is that drug? The drug is a GnRH agonist. It's known in some places as Lupron or Luprolide acetate. It is Zolodex. Someone just asked, yes, in Trinidad and Tobago, it's called Zolodex. And um, we do that. So I have patients home. Now I know, I happen to know that there are a couple surgeons in Trinidad and Tobago who've counseled patients that they're not going to give them Zolodex because it makes the surgery harder. 
I have to say, in my experience, that has not been the case. It has not been harder. And I'm saying that from years of doing this surgery, starting back to my times at John Hopkins and at Yale and now in private practice. And I do it routinely um, to do that. Uh, someone says, in the UK, Esmia, aka Fribristol, Eulocrystal Acetate, which was used to pre-shrink fibroids, has been recalled due to liver damage. I actually have never prescribed Eulocrystal to this date, and I still don't. I still don't. Okay. If I'm going to use something, I use GNRH agonists. Okay. Yes, go ahead. We have, um, we have two raised hands, but I saw yes. Orlando asking questions in the chat box so Antonia if you're still there do you want to ask your question yeah I just have a quick question hi everyone hi I'm grateful for this session Dr. Duke like I am going to hunt you down after this um, <laughs> Because my question, you've answered a lot of my questions based on the research I've been doing. I've actually been looking into the University of UCLA, MDC. Yes. I've mm -hmm. done a lot of research and I've been looking yes. into Dr. Christopher um, in terms of him helping me because I have been looking for invasive. So my last actual reading, and I know mm -hmm. everybody four months, so I am a little extra case. I am five months plus. And yes. uh, we said, I will based I actually do hide from them because every reading they say I need to have urgent surgery every time I go for my ultrasound. Yeah. Um, but because what they are recommending, I'm not really for. Um, so I've been trying to find the most invasive. I am 9.2 centimeters. Um, mm -hmm. It's just in my womb and I carry multiple outer and yes. uh, in the lower area as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, my stomach does protrude a lot. Um, I have a bulky um, uterus. It extends mm -hmm. into my abdomen. And yes. In, in both left and right upper quadrant. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question to you is in regards to two procedures I came across. So mm -hmm. I have heard of the robotic laparoscopic uh, myomectomy, but I've yes. also heard of the radiofrequency and the ablation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the magnetic yes. um, resonance guide. Um, yes. What is your take on that for a patient like myself? I don't no longer. So I used to have, everybody have their own faith, but I believe that God did intervene in mine. Every symptom you described, I used to have it. Mm -hmm. I used, But I no longer have heavy bleeding. I no longer have problems with going to the bathroom and constipation. I no longer have problems with um peeing because i used to have all those issues because of yes that, I'm they could push on your bladder and right. cause you to oh, need to oh, pee oh. every hour mm -hmm. right so that's what i used to be going through um but my guy you know, said due to the fact that what i did was i changed my diet mm -hmm. and i changed uh, a lot of things i changed which i think mm -hmm. is why i'm experiencing the symptoms not being there however i do have a stomach that is large and growing so i no longer eat meats and all these mm -hmm. things Mm -hmm. It has created a great big difference in my yes, life. Yes, it does. It does. Yes, we have I have regular periods now. It's just a matter of removing it because it still grows. Bulky. Feeding mm -hmm. it. So yes. I want to know about those two procedures. Procedures. If it's mm -hmm. if it is a possibility that someone in my case could I use something like that, or would you still refer me to having a myomectomy mm -hmm. or a robotic laparoscopic myomectomy? Yes. Um, the, it really lies on the big question I said everybody needs to ask, which is, do you have any intention of carrying a baby in the future? Even if it's not yes. for sure. Yes. Ask me that. No, yes. yes. So then, no, we don't recommend doing the radiofrequency ablation or the magnetic resonance guided ablation um, if your plan is to carry a baby. As a matter of fact, the MRI guided one is still considered experimental. So it's not considered standard of care. The radio frequency ablation one, which is using the sound, it's still on your belly, going in through your belly with a special probe, attaching it to the fibroid, and then sending in radio waves to dismantle the fibroid. Um, it's fairly new. It's been around at this point, the primary company in the United States, um, that it's Accessa, that's, um, that's marketing it. They've been around for about four years. Um, I have been a speaker for them. So full disclosure, but I still don't think it has a role for people who are planning future fertility. Now, if you're someone who says, you know what, doctor, I've had my kids, I've tied my tubes. I just don't 
lose my uterus. Then yes, I would say either of those two or the uterine fibroid embryolization is a reasonable next step. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it if your plan is carrying a baby at all in the future. For you, a myomectomy makes sense, whether it's laparoscopic, which is the robotic version, or whether it's an open one, where they do a cut like a C-section or the up and down, like I described, from the belly button to your pubic bone. Um, that would make more sense. Um, I think it's great that your symptoms have improved and it makes sense to me. I would tell you that I counsel all my patients on dietary changes. Um, we know diet has estrogenic effects and ingredients. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, yes, for the most part, if we were eating the food that we cooked, if we were eating the animals that we raised ourselves, it's very organic. But the truth is for a lot of us, we are now buying our food in stores uh, and we're importing our food. We're importing our vegetables. We're importing our meat. We're importing our milk. And just to be clear, from practically any animal raised on a large scale where you need to constantly produce meat, they have to use some hormones to help them grow faster. They have to use antibiotics to keep them healthy because they're growing and living in such close quarters that they can spread disease to each other. So they have to give them antibiotics to keep them from getting sick, especially just before they're slaughtered because um, the slaughter sites get inspected, right? So they have to make sure they're disease free or else they could lose a whole uh, year's worth of a cow or, or two years worth of beef. And so it's imperative that the mass farmers and producers give them hormones and antibiotics. The problem is hormones, just like they sound, they'll act as hormones even in our own bodies. But a lot of the antibiotics also function as hormones in the human body. And so it's, we actually tell someone if you have fibroids, if you have endometriosis, chronic pelvic pain, or to be perfectly honest at this point, if you're having any sort of pain type or discomfort as it relates to your um, pelvis or fertility, the things I recommend are first, you know, cutting back on red meat intake. If you're going to eat red meat, it should be grass fed. It should be antibiotic free, hormone free, yes. you know. Um, so it should be, if you're going to buy meat, then I would recommend going to the market, finding the local butcher who you also know raises their own animal and that's your source because you can ask them directly right are you using hormones are you using antibiotic free feed and we have to keep that in mind because even the feed right they're not going around injecting the animals with a with a, in, a needle or a syringe it's actually built into the food they're yeah. giving them and so that's why we say grass-fed because then you know what they're eating it's not these store-bought feed that also have antibiotics built in the same goes for milk. So I know most people don't realize it, but in order to keep a cow making milk, you either have to keep her pregnant or keep her um, sort of stocked up with a certain hormone that keeps her lactating, right? And so, you know, I grew up in Tobago. I'm a country girl, right? I grew up in the countryside. And when I was growing up, I drank cow's milk, but we did, cow's milk, you only got it when, you know, you'd actually hear that Mr. In our case with our gal, we had a relative in Roxborough, Vaughan, and you would hear Vaughan cow drop, right? And when you hear that, that meant there was fresh milk coming. <laughs> um, and of course, it tasted amazing. It's so different from the milk you buy in the store, or even powdered milk. But it's important to know that in order to keep cows, commercial lactating dairy cows, making milk, um, they either have to keep them pregnant or keep their bodies feeling like they're in a state of pregnancy with hormones. So I talk about that. The other thing I recommend is cutting back on your, um, while we say eat a plant-based diet, you want to cut back on your soy products unless they're fermented soy. And that's because soy actually is what we call a phytoestrogen. Um, it has it has plant-based estrogens. And so they can mimic a lot of the estrogen type activity in your body, which like I said, estrogen is what grows fibroids. And so, you know, if you are making dietary changes, I try not to 
preach to people about diet because diet has so many other factors, right? It, it has to do with your schedule. It has to do with your economics. It has to do with so much. But if you have control over it, I would say really, you know, grow your own food when you can. You know, I live in Las Vegas, but I grow my own food right here. Um, I... I, I don't really eat meat, but that was a choice I made about five years ago. Um, I only eat meat if my mom has to really tempt me with a Trini style food. And then I'll be like, yeah, well, I'm going to have that one. Um, but it's really important to know uh, what's in your food. And this is important, not just for you, but for your daughters, your sons, it's literally impacting your fertility as well. Because a lot of these hormones, like I said, they act like estrogen or they disrupt estrogen signaling in your body so they're what we call hormonal disruptors so it's important to know that and lastly um you know plastics styrofoams uh, a lot of our packaging actually release hormonal disruptors more common ones are bpa or bisphenol and the other is phthalate um i can see the cosmetic see it in the packing of the plastics the containers we use to um to store our food. So we certainly say, you know, if the least you can do is don't heat up your food in a microwave if it's stored in plastic, right? Transfer a thing that's made ceramic or glass, heat it up. That way you don't run the risk of chemicals leaching out from your container into your food. So if you go online and you research, you'll actually see that the Food and Drug Administration of the United States says, oh, we don't have a bisphenol, BP um, limit, because we don't think any one food has enough of it to be toxic. And that might be true, but what the FDA doesn't know is very few people read food labels, right? How many of you literally only eat the number of that a Crick's bag says to eat at once? No, you eat as much as you feel like. How many of us only eat you know, the, if you're using canned goods, you're only eating the amount that you're supposed to eat as opposed to filling up your plate. Guess what? A lot of the cans that they can foods in are lined with plastics that have BPA in them. So now you actually have to read the can. And if it doesn't say BPA free, it means they're not willing to go out on a limb to tell you that because they probably have some BPA in the lining of the can. And so those are things I counsel my patients on, and it makes a difference. I've had patients who are doing fertility treatments, IVF. I tell them to make dietary changes for 12 weeks um, and come back, and we have a whole different outcome. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Duke. Actually, a lot of this information that you're sharing as it relates to diet is um, something that we try to um, encourage a lot. In fact, when a number of when a lot of the calls come in, um, we yes. do know that there are the economic implications because it's what you can afford. Um, yes, ability, the reality of accessing organic food, knowing mm -hmm. your food source. Yes, um, we still try to encourage a lot. Actually, we did a while back, um, like an infographic on foods and fibroids because you yes. know. Persons will say, okay, eat healthier, stay away from meat, and then you assume it's plant-based. But then right. there are foods, as you said, the phytoestrogens or yes. the estrogens in plant that affects the body as well. It triggers the body. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, you really have to do your research. You also have you to listen to your body, know your mm -hmm. body, and take yes. of you, mind, yes. body, and spirit. Um, some of the questions are coming in. So we had one that is looking at you being a virologist. Um, yes. If you could touch on COVID-19 surgery and pregnancy. Um, yes. one, that person also asks about where your practice is. I can say it's in Nevada, which is in Las Vegas. Yes. My favorite Correct. Really. <laughs> um, and of course, she touched on the plant-based diet. So I think um, you may have had that question answered. Yes. And... Um, we have someone who is saying they're 35 years of age and they have about seven fibroids of different mm -hmm. type. 
what mm-hmm. type of surgery would you recommend? And finally, but I'll review. Finally, yes. there's one person who, is, who asked about having chronic inflammation in the cervix. Yes. Doctors and nurses can't say why. So this person is based. So cervicitis. This person yeah. has cervicitis. Yes. So mm-hmm. that's a fibroid surgery. Seven. Um, yes. Lots of fibroids. Mm-hmm. Let me have a question about you being a virologist and if you could touch on, mm-hmm. you know, pregnancy yeah. and surgery and then the cervix question. Yeah. So lots of fibroids, the route of surgery depends on your symptoms and the location. So I will tell you, I do a lot of combo surgeries, right? So like I said, the submucosal, which is the one in the cavity, requires going in through the vagina and addressing the fibroids. So most times when my patients have that plus the intramural or subserosal, what I do is the first half an hour of the surgery when they're first asleep is I go in through the vagina with the hysteroscope. I take care of the surgery there first. Then I put a balloon in the womb to keep the cavity expanded. And then I go up top and do the belly surgery. Now I put the balloon in the womb because I've also put a blue dye in it. So that as I'm doing the surgery on the outside of the womb through the belly, if I see any blue dye, it means I've entered the cavity and I'm going to need to do special things to preserve their fertility to make sure the cavity doesn't scar shut as they're healing from their myomectomy. Um, That's something I do. I have to be honest, that's something that mostly fertility specialists do when we're doing fibroid surgery. Um, Not even the minimally invasive surgeons necessarily do that. Now I'm saying not even necessarily because some of them do. Um, There are some that I know very well who um, from talking to them, they're like, yeah, I'm gonna do that, Cindy. I like that idea. So that's what we do. So I do combos very frequently, which is hysteroscopy, plus the either laparoscopic or open myomectomy. Um, And so that's the first thing. But for some people also, it depends on your symptoms, right? You may have seven fibroids, or maybe the ones in the wall, the intramurals, they're only two centimeters, three centimeters. I'm not going to run after them if you're not having bulk symptoms and stuff. I may only say, you know what, let's do hysteroscopy, take care of the one in the cavity, let's get you pregnant, let's have your babies, and then we'll deal with this if it's a bigger issue after you're done having your kids, right? So it's all about prioritizing based on patient symptoms, patient's goals. Um, And I know I sound very uh, patient-centric, but it's the truth, right? I really the whole point of treatment is to make you better, but in the context of fertility is to also help you have that baby or those children you're looking to have. It's not to say I did a fabulous job, but now you can't carry babies. Then I might as well have just told you to do a hysterectomy and get a surrogate, you know? Um, So I, it's really important that we balance the goals here, which is doctor goals and patient goals. Um, And it's important to know that. Mm -hmm. Um, as you're on surgery before you move off, there's a yes. question that we tie in. If mm-hmm. you don't have a fibroid that yes. is uh, 14 centimeters, what yes. is your size? So pedunculated, I'm presuming you mean a subserosal pedunculated fibroid, 14 centimeters. I mean, just remember a baby's head is 10 centimeters, a newborn, right? So 14 centimeters is a big fibroid. Um, And so I would recommend going in, if that's the only thing, that's actually a surgery that's done in less than an hour. You just go in, you take off the stalk. So pedunculated means it's a fibroid on a stalk. So if this is the fibroid, this is the stalk, a very thin stock. The stock is easy. You just go in and tie it off and the fibroid is off. Um, so that's how we remove those. Uh, the surgery, like I said, it's quick. Um, most OBGYNs can do that. You don't necessarily need a minimally invasive specialist if the only problematic fibroid is pedunculated. Um, surgery and COVID-19. So certainly um, here in the United States, Actually, most places in the world, uh, surgeries in the hospital were suspended um, in part because in order to have a myomectomy, to be perfectly honest with you, you have to be put to sleep and put on a ventilator to breathe. To 
conserve resources and to prioritize resources, namely ventilators for COVID-19 patients, it was recommended that all elective surgeries be halted. Now in the US for sure, and I know in Australia, and I suspect now in Trinidad and Tobago, given that they're entering stage four or phase four, I think, of reopening, um, many places are allowing surgeries again. So like here in the state of Nevada, we have been doing surgery now for three weeks. So I've resumed surgeries, which is why I have been doing surgeries of late. Um, COVID-19, specific to COVID-19, I have, and my recommendation as a virologist, public health specialist, is that patients get screened, right? So before surgery, even the week before, we call to see if they're having any symptoms, any symptoms that might at all be COVID-19 like or coronavirus infection. But in addition to that, the hospitals are now requiring that patients get tested before they show up to the hospital for surgery. So every patient here in the state of Nevada has to, well, the city of Las Vegas, I can't speak for other cities in Nevada yet, but in the city of Las Vegas, we have concluded in terms of the COVID-19 committees here at the hospitals. I serve on the committee at a couple hospitals here. And so before surgery, five days before surgery, everybody gets antibody tested. And we are testing them for IgG, IgM, and IgA as an apple. And the reason why we're doing this is because we know IgG, if you're positive IgG, it means you were exposed slash infected but a while ago, somewhere between six plus weeks before. If you're IgM positive, you had an active infection within the last four to five weeks. If you're IgA positive, you are actively infected. Um, IgA is what we call the mucosal immunoglobulin. It's the antibody that your mucosal surfaces make, meaning it's the first antibody that your body would make if you're infected through your nose, through your mouth, through your stomach. And so if somebody is IgA positive, then we call them and say your surgery has to be delayed for another 12 weeks. So that's what we're doing here. Um, and of course, screening them for symptoms so that they can know that other people, they should be on isolation or if they need to go to the hospital because they were homesick and didn't realize it. Um, so that's what we're doing. In terms of in the hospital, everybody's wearing a mask, not just the doctors, our patients, their family members, only one person is allowed to come with them. They have to wear a mask. Um, and that has to happen throughout the course of the hospitalization. Certainly right now, uh, we're recommending that patients, if possible, you send them home on the same day of surgery, as opposed to admitting them to the hospital where you're increasing their chance of possibly interacting with someone who could infect them. So um, in the case of like the robotic myomectomies, typically patients are admitted to the hospital for an overnight stay. Uh, currently now, though, there's a big push to see if you can send them home. So you do the surgery early in the morning, they spend some time in the hospital recovery area that day, and you try to send them home by night um, to help. Uh, so that's the COVID-19 and pregnancy question. And I'm sorry, what was the third? The th was it diet? Um, was it the chronic inflammation? Ah, cervicitis, correct. So chronic inflammation, you can have chronic inflammation of any part of your pelvic or reproductive system. So basically the itis, right? You know, we talk about the itis when people overeat and fall asleep, but actually inflammation of any organ, um, we just add ITIS to really imply inflammation of that organ. So the cervix, which is the neck of the womb can become inflamed or infected. Uh, chronic cervicitis, um, the most common cause is actually infection-based. Uh, chlamydia can cause a cervicitis. Um, it's important to diagnose chlamydia early because chlamydia is the number one infectious cause of tubal factor infertility in women, which is um, blocked tubes. And so that's one of the things is they should screen for that. But there are other things, right? Non-infectious causes or non transmitted infectious causes of cervicitis. So some people have inflammation of the cervix from a change in bacterial pH in the vagina. Um, and so for those patients, we really counsel them to watch their diet. If your cervicitis is specific to a certain part of your cycle, maybe then figuring out what you're eating and maybe your body processes it differently 
in that time of your cycle. So you want to withdraw that from your um, diet. Um, for some women, uh, they have either chronic urinary tract infections, chronic cervicitis after intercourse. And so for those women, we may actually do what's called prophylactic or preventive type antibiotics, which is like if you're having chronic cystitis, which is chronic um, bladder irritation slash urinary tract infection after intercourse, we prescribe you an antibiotic that you take um, immediately following intercourse for a day or two just to prevent things from becoming inflamed. Um, and so I think the first question is, what are they doing exactly when they tell you you have it again? How are they diagnosing it? What tests are are they running and what do you need? Um, other types of inflammation, you can have inflammation of the lining of the womb, chronic endometritis. If you have that, it can lead to heavy bleeding, just unexplained heavy bleeding or like the person who comes in with bleeding the whole month. Doctor, I don't understand. Um, or someone who has recurrent miscarriage might even have chronic endometritis. So I have some patients for whom that's how I treat their recurrent miscarriage is I do a biopsy of the lining of their womb, diagnose endometritis, um, treat them with antibiotics, then they get pregnant and have their babies. Um, and so it's important to know that sort of thing. But again, it depends on uh, who you're seeing. Is it a general practitioner? Is it a subspecialty trained physician? And even within our subspecialties, it has to be someone who feels comfortable with that topic area. All right. So we just have a few more questions as yes. we begin to wrap up. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is, do you still come to Trinidad to do this? <laughs> yes. Uh, we also had some questions related to menopause, mm -hmm. right? So listening mm -hmm they had um, keyhole surgery and then yes. they shifted into early menopause. So they mm -hmm. wanted to know if there was any way that early menopause could be prevented. And mm -hmm. also in line with menopause, one person um, shared that they rightfully heard, you know, after menopause, fibroids shrink naturally. But what it would you should. advise? Yeah, what would you advise even though you've gone through or are going through menopause and you mm -hmm. have fibroids? And lastly, um, well, not final, final, but for now, I'm um, freezing eggs and surrogacy. Yes. Um, you could speak to that. And mm -hmm. do you offer these options, you know, for persons who uh, may be considering alternatives if, mm -hmm. you know, they're sure. really having yeah. Um, so Antonia, I think, asked the question, do you still come to Trinidad and Tobago to do surgery? Um, I do. I honestly haven't come in over a year. Um, I was supposed to come <laughs> in April of this year, finally, and we all know what happened there. Um, but I do. I still see patients virtually. Um, and I have, for some patients, actually referred them to colleagues either there in Trinidad colleagues in Barbados, colleagues in Miami um, for some. And then, of course, some have come to Nevada because then I haven't really changed my scheduling here as of May. So, yes, yes. When am I coming next? Um, I don't know yet, to be honest with you. Um, if there wasn't COVID-19, I would have been there in April and I would have been there in August of this year. Um, because of COVID-19, I have just suspended all plans. I haven't made any international plans, to be honest with you. Um, so that's the short answer. But do I have patients in Trinidad right now and Tobago, obviously, with fibroids? Yes. How am I treating them? I have some of them on Zolodex. I have some of them on birth control. I have all of them on dietary changes. I have um, some of them. Basically, we're just waiting to see what we do next. Do we bring them to, say, Florida? Um, whether they're going to see someone there or are they in a good place where they can wait until they come down. Um, the other question has to be, speak to menopause. So pause following my, my, myomectomy. Yes. So this is another side of myomectomy of fibroid embolization or the MRI based ones, which is like I was saying, you can unfortunately cut off blood supply, the important things, if the surgeon isn't careful. And so if you cut off blood supply to the ovaries, you can kill off some of the eggs, so to speak. And of course, the person will then go into menopause. 
As a matter of fact, what I do for my fertility patients, particularly if we were planning in vitro or IVF anyway, is I go in, we take out the eggs, we fertilize the eggs, we freeze the embryos, and then we do the myomectomy, meaning we take out the fibroids, have them heal for, and this is, I mean, a big surgery. I'm not talking just the hysteroscopy why I go in through the womb. I'm talking about the ones where they either need multiple small cuts, as in the robotic laparoscopic type, or the C type pelvic um, bikini scar. If I had to do either of those two surgeries, the abdominal type myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy, then if I can safely access the ovaries before surgery, in the month or two before surgery, we go in and we take out the eggs, create embryos if in vitro was the plan, and we freeze the embryos. That way I've maximized her results that she can get. And then we fix the house so the tenants can go in, but we've already frozen the tenants. So I like to call the, the uterus the house and fixing it for tenants in the context of pregnancy. So that's the reason why I say don't do fibroid embolization um, because if you're planning, when I say don't do, this is not saying don't do fibroid embolization in general. I mean, if you're planning future for the at all, fibroid embolization should not be your procedure of choice. And it's because, like I said, it can change the integrity of the muscle of the womb and its ability to stretch and really house a pregnancy, particularly if you end up pregnant with more than one baby, then you're really high risk because you're really testing the capacity of your womb muscles that were exposed to this embolization. But also for those with, for future fertility, you're also decreasing possibly if one of the emboli went off and cut off blood supply to part of the ovary or both ovaries, you've now um, compromised your ovarian reserve. So that's why I recommend that. But let's say you did go into menopause. Menopause is defined as no period for one year right? So you have to have 12 months of zero period for us to say on paper, you're in menopause. And it's not just 12 months of zero period, but we also have to do a test called FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, and see that it's for at least two months straight, in addition to 12 months of no period, you've had at least two months where your FSH was above 40. Um, and that would mean that your brain is screaming at the ovaries trying to find an egg, but it can't. And so that's what that means. But if you ended up in menopause, um, true menopause, then yes, um, you won't have eggs left that you can get pregnant with. Now, it doesn't mean you cannot get pregnant, but you now need donor eggs, meaning egg from somebody younger to help you get pregnant. And certainly, you, some of you have probably heard me share in, in other uh, fora that I have patients who get pregnant post-menopause, not with their own eggs, but with donor eggs. So my oldest patient currently who's pregnant is 56, um, and that's using donor eggs. So there are lots of ways to achieve pregnancy um, if you've entered menopause. Um, how do you prevent this from happening? Well, that's what I just described. So one, the selection of the procedure is important. Two, talking to your doctor again to really explain your goals here, which is yes, you want your fibroids addressed, but you want your fertility preserved and you don't really want to compromise your ovarian reserve as well. Um, Someone says, if it gives anyone hope, I had a 22 centimeter pedunculated um, fibroid, smaller ones removed by abdominal myomectomy, went on to have healthy twins without IVF. Absolutely. And again, I want people to know IVF isn't a requirement once you've done um, fibroid surgery. Let's be honest here. While IVF is the most popularized fertility treatment, it's not the most common fertility treatment, right? So like at my clinic, only about... 25% of all the patients I see use IVF to achieve pregnancy. The majority are either getting pregnant because I'm treating their inflammation, we're treating their endometriosis, we're giving them medicine, these eggs, we're doing insemination. Our host, and if you're in a sexual relationship, has normal or good enough sperm counts. Um, is it possible to get a thick but detail of what not to eat? 
diagnose myself with PCOS because of symptoms I've experienced. And when I did an ultrasound, I found out I have cysts on my left ovaries. So it's important to know that having cysts doesn't necessarily mean you have PCOS. The name polycystic ovary cyst syndrome is actually what I call a misnomer because it's not based on cysts. Every woman actually makes cysts at some points in our lives. So it's more a constellation of symptoms. I actually have a really nice blog article, which um, Fati can share with you, which is the bomb myths about PCOS. In there, I also go over as well. So it's a good one. Um, um, if I you, could yeah. add quickly, related to um, that PCOS question also. So mm -hmm. week before last week, we actually touched, the session before the last, we touched on PCOS mm -hmm. and very, very adamant and encouraging persons not to self-diagnose because not because yes. you persist means you have PCOS. And yeah. um, Dr. Armstrong was online, who actually was the one who went through, and we also yes. posted that to our YouTube page. So Miss K, yes. we encourage you to visit our YouTube page. In addition to reading Dr. Duke's presentation, you can actually look at that presentation because it was visual. And she spoke about the cycle and explained, you know, what are the things you look for. And of course, at Fibroid Awareness TT, do not self-diagnose. You need to get to a specialist who can tell you. So we share the information, but do not self-diagnose. Right? Yes, so I agree with that. And again, everybody can make cysts. So cysts and peace. I know the word PCOS has cysts in there, but they're not mm -hmm. what you think cysts are. The they're very different. We had a question um, regarding polyps, treatment for polyps, um, three centimeter. That person was very specific about what they mm -hmm. had. And then mm -hmm. we had another question. Um, calcified fibroids is GNRH. Um, Effective. I see it. This is from yeah. Shinaka or Shinaka. Shinaka. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Yeah. So, First question you asked was the polyps. To, 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 to polyps, right. So a uterine polyp, think of it as a skin tag, you know, like how some of us have skin tags growing any other part of our, on any other part of our body. That's what a uterine polyp is as well. So uterine polyps grow within the cavity of the lining, that part of your uterine cavity that sheds every month. And they can grow to be quite large. A three centimeter polyp is very large. And usually the symptoms of a polyp are primarily heavy bleeding. When you do have your period, you may even have spotting. Um, you know, maybe you're somebody who historically your period is four to five days long. But now because of the polyp, you have a four to five day period. But you also have spotting before or after or both. Um, Polyps can also lead to miscarriage. They can lead to failure of implantation. They definitely have a negative impact if you're doing insemination or IVF because it actually sort of interrupts the path that the catheter that's delivering the sperm or the embryos has to pass. And so I recommend surgery for that. And the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, as well as ESHRA, the European Society of Human Reproduction, recommends that anybody with a um, polyp one centimeter, meaning 10 millimeters or greater, should have it removed if fertility is part of their goal. And so three centimeters, absolutely. Um, a polyp like a fibroid should go away once you've gone into menopause. Um, key here, if you have had menopause, you were told you're in menopause by your medical provider and your periods come back all of a sudden, um, don't just say, oh, my periods are back. Make sure it's checked out because once your period goes away and a formal diagnosis of menopause is made in the way I described it, which is 12 months of absent period, elevated FSH, and you know all that. Usually you have hot flashes and all that else too. If your period comes back, that's concerning for it being something else. Um, same thing for a polyp. You shouldn't really be growing polyps postmenopausal. So if you have polyps postmenopausal, that should be addressed quickly because it might be a sign of a cancer growing and not um, 
just a polyp. Um, in addition to, uh, what else did we have? Egg freezing, egg freezing. Mm -hmm. So egg freezing, we recommend egg freezing. I certainly encourage all women over age 30 to consider freezing eggs. Why? Freezing eggs doesn't mean you have to use your frozen eggs, but certainly freezing your eggs allows you the opportunity to have an option for birthing children from your own eggs later on in life if you don't know when that's gonna be. So the whole thing about egg freezing is based on the principle, which is we know that as women, we're born with all of our eggs. We don't make new ones. And so as you age, your egg numbers decline. On average, if you're not PCOS, you're born with somewhere between one to two million eggs. When a baby girl is born, that's how many eggs are in her ovary. By the time she starts puberty, she's down to somewhere around 400,000 eggs, just to give you a sense of how those eggs drop. But get this, right? By the time she's 30, 70% of the eggs she was born with, they're gone they're gone. And by the time she's 40, only 3% of what she was born with is remaining on average. And so your egg numbers really drop, they plummet down. And even more so, they're aging with you, right? So whatever age you are at about four months, that's how old your eggs are, because they form somewhere around 20 weeks in the belly when you're growing, developing in your mom's womb. So it's important to know that. Um, and so this is why we recommend freezing eggs because as your eggs get older, they perform less well, meaning they're less likely to be fertilized, less likely to yield a pregnancy, meaning implants, less likely to yield a live born baby, less likely to yield a baby that may not have chromosomal differences like Down syndrome, et cetera. So it's important to know that. And the way you can pause that or stop the clock from aging if you're interested is egg freezing. Now egg freezing is interesting in that you need to get your eggs frozen by people who know how to thaw eggs. So not everybody who freezes an egg knows how to thaw the egg. So it's really important that if you decide to freeze your eggs, you do the following research. You want to ask the clinic, have you thawed eggs before? If they're hemming and hawing, that's not the clinic where you should freeze your eggs. The next question you should ask them is, of the eggs you've thawed that were frozen, how many have yielded babies? If your clinic, again, hems and haws, and they don't have any babies born from thawed eggs, maybe that's not the place for you to freeze your eggs at. The other things are, when you're freezing your eggs, are you planning to carry your own baby or do you already know, you know what, I'm not going to be carrying a baby? Or are you somebody who maybe had a hysterectomy? I have patients who've had hysterectomies because they were not counseled appropriately about their fibroids, for example, and they end up with a hysterectomy. Or during the myomectomy surgery, they ended up losing their uterus, hysterectomy. Then for those patients, we can still take eggs from your ovaries, mind you. If your doctor didn't remove your ovary, I can still take eggs from someone whose uterus was taken out, create embryos, and then put them in another womb. It could be somebody you know, a friend, a relative, your mom or a surrogate that you hire, you pay for. So there are lots of options and it's important to know about that too. But if you're going to be using anyone else, then at the time that they're freezing your eggs, particularly if you're based in the US or you're doing it at a clinic in the US, meaning you've traveled to the US, they need to do FDA labs because the Food and Drug Administration actually controls Every clinic, they rate any clinic that's going to take thing from one person and put it in another person. And so at the time that your eggs are frozen, it needs to have FDA labs drawn from you, meaning blood tests for you from, for HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, Zika, uh, HTLV, and I'm pretty sure very soon it would also include COVID. Um, and that's because if they didn't do that for you and you froze your eggs and then you come back 10 years later and you wanted to go into someone else, they can't use your eggs. They can't use them because the FDA blocks it. And so it's important. It's only like a $400 US spend, but it's important that you spend that 400 US now and not find 10 years later, you still can't do what you want to do with your eggs. 
So that's important. Um, other things to know is if you're going to be freezing your eggs, you know, make sure you're already on some supplements. Actually, if you're going to do any fertility treatments, right? So you should be on CoQ10, which really boosts the energy in your eggs. That's coenzyme Q10. It's over the counter. It's not a prescription. You don't need a single healthcare provider to prescribe this. Um, 400 milligrams once daily. Ideally, start at 12 weeks before your planned treatment. If you're someone who's just trying to get pregnant at home, you should be on that. This is to help boost eggs energy. Um, Myo inositol is another one we recommend, especially if you have PCOS or PCO type symptoms. It's an insulin sensitizer. It kind of works like metformin, but it's a natural weaker um, agent. And so it works to help your muscle cells and the cells that are in your ovaries taking care of your eggs all this time. It helps them use sugar and natural sugars better. And so you should be at about 2,000 units of that daily. Um, so those are all things. But notice we've only been talking about the women, right? If you're someone in a heterosexual relationship with a male partner, he should also, if you're talking fertility, he should be getting semen analyses. He should be drinking water. He should be getting his underlying health issues addressed. If he's diabetic, his diabetes needs to be addressed and managed well so that he can have good ejaculation, good sperm counts, and so forth. He, if his sperm counts are low, there are medicines we can put guys on. I have a lot of guys in Trinidad and Tobago on medicines to help boost their sperm counts, boost their... Um, libido, which is their sex drive, boost their energy without putting them on testosterone. Because the one thing you don't want your partner going on is testosterone. Testosterone is essentially male birth control. That's all I want everybody to remember. If a guy is taking testosterone, he's on birth control. He could tell you it's your fault. It's you why you're not getting pregnant. But no, if he's on testosterone, he's on birth control. Just know that. Um, so those are important things to keep in mind as well. Thank you. All right. So we're definitely wrapping up now. And I'm going to share this question. The same the question from Chinaka related to GNRH and calcified fibroids. Mm -hmm. And we had one um, question. Somebody uh, just yes. wants the name of that process where, the, where you mentioned the recycling of the blood. Is mm. there a name for that process? Yes. Um, yes. So those are the two questions. And then we can wrap up and share our handles. And, yes. Um, yeah. So yes, right. If you have calcified fibroids, which means that the core of the fibroid has already basically stopped getting a good blood supply, it's now gone hard. It's calcified. The the GnRH antagonist rather, because we use antagonists as well, that's coming out soon on the market for fibroids. But right now the GnRH agonists, so like Zolodex, et cetera, they're not as effective on a calcified fibroid. Now, usually we're not giving that medicine to a patient who only has one fibroid though, right? Usually it's a person, like I said, with a big bulky uterus, a lot of fibroids, some of them may be calcified, but most of the others will not be. And so it's still going to have its impact, but it'll have a better impact on a fibroid that's not calcified than one that is. That is correct. Um, the same thing goes for fibroid embolization. Fibroid embolization does not work on a calcified fibroid. Because again, the whole purpose of embolization is to cut off blood supply. If it's calcified, it already doesn't really have a very good blood supply. So the embolization isn't going to make a difference in how it grows. So that's important to know. Um, the recommendation question, what was the recommendation question? Um, the, what's the name of the process? Ah, yes. So it's called Cell Ooh. Saver, C-E-L-S-A-V-E-R. It's Cell Saver. Um, mm. You can Google it, but you should ask, does the hospital have a Cell Saver? So it actually belongs to the hospital or okay. your operating suite, et cetera. Um, and so I know here in the U.S., most hospitals have it. A couple hospitals in Trinidad have it. Um, they, they charge you an extra fee. But yes, Cell Saver, C-E-L-S-A-V-E-R. Now, if your surgery is a surgery for cancer, they're probably not going to use Cell Saver because the last thing they want is to recycle cancer cells back into your body. So this is more for a young person doing fibroid surgery. If this is your mom, your auntie, somebody who's 
over the age or postmenopausal having a surgery for a cancer or a suspected cancer, they may say no to cell saver. And that's why. That's why. But certainly we use cell saver in that context. We use it in the context of, say, a Jehovah's Witness pregnant woman who is anemic, but needs to have emergency surgery where she's going to lose a lot of blood. They'll implement a cell saver if they can plan ahead so that, again, you reduce her mobility and ultimately her mortality. That's what that's for. All right. Two more. And that's it. <laughs> yes. What has to do with... Um, treating multiple issues at once yes so there's one person who has to have a myomectomy and mm -hmm. cystectomy done soon yes. have mm -hmm. you ever had the experience of removing multiple intramural fibroids hemorrhagic cysts and endometrial lesions in one go and then yes. there's another person that came in a bit late that is asking about fibroids that um do not should not be treated or if you know you have their fibroids that you should leave alone that kind of thing Okay, so yes, many people have uh, concurrent disease processes occurring. And so you can have somebody with endometriosis, which is the presence of cells that should be in the lining now in other parts of the reproductive system or the pelvis requiring a cleanup, um, especially if it's for fertility. I do a lot of those combos because I'm going in to clean up the endometriosis so I can decrease inflammation around the fallopian tubes and stuff. Um, I'm taking out fibroids because I want to help with bleeding. I want to improve bulk symptoms. Um, cyst removal, it depends on the size. So our formal recommendations are just because someone has a cyst doesn't mean they need surgery, right? And so, like I said earlier, most women will make cysts. And so cysts have been given a bad rap. Most cysts will shrink. If it's a hemorrhagic cyst, it's going to shrink. If it's a simple cyst, it's most likely going to shrink. So the recommendation is when you find a cyst, unless she's having pain or her ovaries being twisted, known as a torsion, if it's not one of those urgent emergency type situations, the recommendation is if you find a cyst, you either put her on birth control for about six weeks and you repeat the ultrasound to see if it's shrunk. If it hasn't shrunk, then you devise a plan to either drain the cyst, which I do routinely in my fertility clinic, or surgery if needed. But why do we try to avoid doing cyst surgeries if we don't have to? Well, remember we just talked about the ovaries, we just talked about the fact that you're born with a finite number of eggs. Well, the truth is, it doesn't matter how skilled your surgeon is. It doesn't matter how expert they are. Every time we peel a cyst off of your ovary, we're taking away some healthy cells, meaning we're taking away eggs. It doesn't matter how good we are. Eggs are coming out too. Because the cyst is part of your ovary. In order to pull it away, we have to peel it off the rest of the ovary. If we're not peeling, we're burning. We actually don't recommend burning cysts away in anybody who plans future pregnancy. Because the thing about burning is your burn doesn't just touch the layer that they're burning. The burn actually, the energy goes through the ovary a few more layers. And so it'll impact um, other layers of ovary and ovarian tissue, to put it simply. So we highly recommend not burning or what we call fulgurating the ovary. So a cyst, if you're going to remove it, it needs to be excised. It needs to be removed, um, especially if you're endometriosis and you have endometriomas or chocolate cysts. And you've probably read that online as well. Excision is better than burning. But when it comes to the ovary, specifically in endometriosis, even excision, we say if it's under four centimeters, even if it's a ovarian endometriosis or an endometrioma, we leave it alone unless she's having really bad pain and discomfort. The goal actually is get her pregnant, get her pregnant right away or put her on medicine to suppress it. Um, endometriosis is actually one that requires its own separate talk because there are a lot of things for endometriosis that there's a lot of misinformation online. Some people have read the excision is preferred recommendation and assume that means they need surgery every year for the endometriosis because they say excision is better. But the truth is you guys should know that the number one cause of low egg number, diminished ovarian reserve, 
in women with endometriosis, it's caused by your by the doctors themselves if we're repeatedly doing surgery on your ovary. Every time we remove cysts from your ovary, we're taking healthy eggs. And so it's not uncommon for me to have a woman come in in her 30s with even 29, 30 young women with history of endometriosis, multiple surgeries, and they're shocked when I say, you don't really have eggs left. Your ovaries are they're tanked. And it's because repeated surgery on your ovary is going to get rid of those eggs. And so it's really important that you don't just read what you see online and run with it thinking, oh, now this means every time I have issues, I need surgery. Um, if your doctor's recommended after surgery, since you're not planning to get pregnant, if you're one of those people that you go on a low dose of progesterone to keep the endometriosis from coming back, that's important. You need to do that. Bridget is asking if I treat endometriosis. Yes. Um, actually, uh, endometriosis is common. It's not more common than fibroids, but societally wise, it causes more issues. So like in the United States, we've actually studied it. Endometriosis costs the United States society $22 billion a year. Why? Because women are in pain. They can't go to work. So, you know, money lost from work, money lost from wages, earnings, disability claims. Wow. And so endometriosis has a huge impact. Um, we say endometriosis affects maybe about 11% of the population based on studies, but we believe it's actually as high as 20 to 25% of women have some form of endometriosis, but not everybody with endometriosis has symptoms. So yes, infertility specialists, we are the actual endometriosis trained specialists, the people who've researched it, I've written papers on it. Um, but most of us, we don't treat it unless it's in the context of somebody with fertility goals. Like I only see endometriosis patients if the OBGYNs are struggling to treat them, then I say, okay, send them to me because I have more available in my wheelhouse, in my medical bag, so to speak, of what I can treat an endo patient with to keep her pain-free, allow her to live her life. And then she comes in just when she's ready to get pregnant. I take her off the stuff that keeps her pain-free so we can get pregnant. Once she's pregnant, she's a normal pregnancy. Once she's delivered, she comes back and we keep it quiet again. The whole goal being to prevent her from needing repeated surgeries. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Duke, as we close up, I know you had touched on earlier about um, fibroids and the, the possibility of them affecting fertility via miscarriages and miscarriages yes. happen for that 24-week mark. And I mm -hmm. just saw a question, it was there earlier, and um, I forgot to mention it, about frequent miscarriages under three months. Um, yes. Only recently, there were a few fibroids found, and they were too... This person is saying the doctor said they were too small to cause the miscarriages. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Before. Well, I think my first question is, how did the doctor assess the fibroids? So if you have frequent miscarriages and also at least one fibroid somewhere, but even if you didn't have a fibroid, somebody should be going into your womb and looking with a camera. That is called hysteroscopy. It's the gold standard. If you are having recurrent miscarriage, somebody needs to look inside the house, literally go and do a walkthrough, okay? And the way you do a walkthrough in the house is you put, you either, you don't have to be asleep, you just need to be comfortable going through the vagina with a tiny camera. The camera is so small, it's smaller than the pencil, right? And it's going in through the womb and looking, we're surveying the entire house. Because it might be a fibroid in there, it might be a polyp in there, you may have something called a septum. You may have what we call a bicornuate uterus, meaning when your uterus formed, because every baby girl, her uterus starts off as two separate tubes and then they fuse, the middle wall goes away and it leaves that space for a baby to grow. In about 5% of baby girls, this wall doesn't completely go away. For some, it doesn't even fuse. And that's when you hear somebody say they were born with two uterus. Is. They're born with what's known as a didelphus. But it's, the wall never went away. That's called a bicornuate. They have two cavities, right? Um, others, it fused. It kind of went away, but it's still there in a way. It's known as a septum or a partial septum. 
partial septums can be removed. A full septum can be removed, but it needs to be assessed. Somebody needs to go in and look and a septum can be removed. A fibroid can be removed. A polyp can be removed. If for some reason you had a DNC or maybe in your last pregnancy or your C-section when they stitched it, they scarred your uterus or they stitched it close. So now you're not getting pregnant or it's the cavity is now too small. So maybe every time you get to three months, the pregnancy can't grow any bigger. You miscarry. Somebody needs to go in and reconstruct your uterine cavity. I do that. Um, I think I shared on my face, my Instagram stories recently, one about a patient. When she came to me, she'd had way more than nine miscarriages in her lifetime. And she kept being told that you don't have fibroids, your womb is fine. But nobody ever looked inside. So I went in, I looked, I discovered that she had a septum. I actually fixed the septum. So I went in with her miscarriage. So a doctor can actually look inside your womb when you have a miscarriage. I do that. It's called embryoscopy. So I go in at that time so I can really identify where was this pregnancy and what's going on? What does it look like? What does the embryo look like? I do that. I go in with my hysteroscope. And so that's what I did for her. And I realized it was a septum and it was implanted on the septum. So I started, I removed the pregnancy, the miscarriage, started fixing it. She moved across country and then traveled back to finish it because she was like, I'm not going anywhere else. I've waited too many years for someone to figure it out. Um, I have another patient where she had a myomectomy. It would have been 2012. She had a myomectomy. And then she kept having miscarriages. She also did IVF twice before she came to see me in 2017. I said, you know what, I know you've had the myomectomy. I know the IVF people told you it had to be the embryos, but I just want to look inside the house. Let me look in the cavity and make sure. I went in and half of her cavity was missing. It was scarred. And I think what happened is when she had her myomectomy, they, you remember I said I leave a balloon in mm -hmm. so I can make sure I don't accidentally enter the cavity. They didn't do that. I had the operative report. I know they didn't do that. And I think as they were stitching her up where they took the fibroid from, they stitched half of her uterus cavity shut. And so it was very narrow. So I had to go in and recreate, open up that side known as lysis of adhesions, fix the cavity. And guess what? She got pregnant on her own because she never had an issue that needed IVF. She was miscarrying because she was not having enough space. Their sperm and egg liked each other. And so there are lots of things that can be done. I would say in this person, it's not enough for a doctor to tell you they're too small. If what they did was just an ultrasound where they didn't actually do a water ultrasound of the cavity or go in with a camera into the cavity, you do not yet have all your answers. Of course, miscarriage could be due to other things. It could be due to a blood factor, either you're clotting too much or not enough. It could be due to thyroid. So if your thyroid is underactive, you can miscarry. It can be due to vitamin D deficiency. It can be due to a number of other genetic things. So recurrent pregnancy loss or recurrent miscarriage requires a full workup by someone who is a specialist in miscarriages. All right. Um, Dr. Duke, it is just after four your th time, I think. Yes, and yes. I know you have a session at five o'clock. Five, I do my virtual happy hour on Instagram. I Nothing serious. <laughs> All right. Um, I really want to thank you tremendously for just taking the time to share with us. My pleasure. Ladies, I think I saw a few men come in. I don't know if they're still here, but ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for joining us this evening for another Sunday evening session. Um, as I said, we talked fertility this evening and she gave us Lanya because you spoke about fibroids you and you know, you just answered questions. And as we look at the comments, the ladies are saying, thank you. It was informative. Um, ladies, Dr. Duke is very, very virtual. She's online. And she's, <laughs> yeah. LinkedIn, she's on Facebook. She has a website. She's on, on Twitter. She's yes. on Twitter. You can find Dr. Duke, because um, persons are wondering if you still come, but you've said you're not sure about international travel this year. Um, also, right. what's the name of your virtual clinic in here in Trinidad? 
So it's a TTCCWH or Trinidad and Tobago Center for Comprehensive Women's Health. They have their own Facebook, their own website. Um, For me, you can find me at Dr. Cindy M. Duke. So D-R-C-I-N-D-Y, Emma's and Mary Duke, Dr. Cindy M. Duke across all social media. So uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest. Uh, my website is drcindyduke.com. From that website, you'd actually see the links at the bottom for my clinics, so you can access that way. But um, you can certainly uh, message me. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and so forth. But on the website, there's a chat function. You can chat through the um, the page, um, yeah, very interactive, very helpful, but I'm also happy to refer to other people. So I'm not one of those doctors where you either need to see me or that's it. Um, if you say, you know, Dr. Cindy, I'm in blah place in the world. Do you know doctors there? If I do, I'll tell you. If I don't, I'll reach out to my network to see who other doctors recommend in that region. Wonderful. And that, that puts a, a wonderful plug for me. So Fibroid Awareness Trinidad and Tobago as a nonprofit, mm-hmm. we have registered with the government of Trinidad and Tobago and our focus is on awareness and advocacy. So yes. for liability reasons, we do not recommend doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, but we get that question a lot. So yes. Dr. Duke, as uh, she said, Dr. Duke does not hold information. I, I just think it's by virtue of who she is and her bringing. So she will do referrals if the case is necessary. And mm-hmm. if you want to do like some of us who fly to Las Vegas to find her <laughs> and then yes. and you have means yes. to do so, then by all means mm-hmm. you can do that. Um, yeah. But she, don't be a stranger. You can reach out to her, and once she's available, she will respond. As it relates to Fibroid Awareness Trinidad and Tobago, we have recently ventured onto the YouTube platform, so we share some of our presentations there. Please go find us, Fibroid Awareness Trinidad and Tobago. Subscribe so that you will get those notifications. And we are also on Twitter, very recently, Facebook, and Instagram, Fibroid Awareness Trinidad and Tobago, as well as at Fibroid TT, that's the Instagram handle. And of course, we have our website. It is www.ttconfidenceproject.org. So that's our main project, our main initiative. But of course, it's our website and you can find me there. You can find us there. Reach out to us and we are open. As I say, we provide psycho support to women. We're actually supporting one patient right through now. She had a myomectomy about a mm-hmm. week and a half ago. So we're there supporting her through. And of course, we try to share as much information as we can as it relates to fibroids, um, lifestyle change. Dr. Duke spoke about it. It mm-hmm. came out. Mm-hmm. Most importantly, we encourage you, please do not self-diagnose. Yes. All right? Get the correct information so that you can make the best choice for you because you know your body and of course eat well if you take care of your body do not lose hope that lady shared that she had um, a surgery and she eventually went on to have twins and the lady who shared last week as we spoke about mental health and coping she was the first person that we supported through a myomectomy and she went on to have twins also naturally so don't lose hope. Do not self-diagnose. Keep a positive mindset and reach out to us, organizations like Fiber Awareness TT and Agreed. doctors like Duke who can openly share with you. They don't withhold information. Information is your key to uh, mental freedom and also taking care of who you are. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Duke. Ladies, if you have questions, remember just to hit us up, find us, message us, call, email. And we are truly grateful for joining us this evening. So that's it. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to say, Dr. Duke, before we close off. Just, oh, you've muted. There we are. Yes, no, I was saying thanks so much for having me. Continue doing the great work. I certainly try to tag you guys whenever I do fibroid type topics on Instagram. 
I just remembered I'm on YouTube, so I forgot about that too. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think everything is amazing advice. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that knowledge is power. Yes. I believe that as black women, in order to advocate for ourselves in medical settings, we need to know. And it's no longer enough for physicians or healthcare providers to treat us as information vessels, meaning they give us information. It's up to us to say what we need to challenge things. Um, and, you know, again, just bring information too. Not medical school, the further away a doctor is from their time in medical school, unless they're actively a professor, the limited their information coming in, right? You're the best you are shortly after training. And unless you're actively improving through continuing medical education, you might be missing some of the new things. And so patients, patients bring things to me all the time. You know, it was because of patients that I started looking more at vitamins. It was because of patients that I did a deep dive into the foods and the, 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 the plastics and so forth, because that's not stuff that's taught in main school, everyday med school curriculum at the time when I was learning. Now it is. People like me are teaching it now, but it was brought to my attention by patients. So you have a role to play. It's a very important role. And lastly, nobody knows your body better than you. Absolutely. Nobody. Nobody. All right. Thanks again. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. It's been a pleasure. Uh, just look out for our updates on when we have our next Sunday evening session or if we um, go on to do um, our usual sessions that we have, whether it's in the afternoon now that the country is opening back up. And we're also going to restart our support group meetings, you know, those face-to-face -face meetings and that kind of thing. All right. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have an amazing week. Um, I don't know if anyone has any general questions for Fiber Awareness CT. Um, if not, then I'll see you again, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, yes, Shanaka, the recordings of these sessions, well, depending on how much um, personal detail is shared, um, the, some sessions are posted, um, some sessions are kept private, but for sure this session will be shared. Um, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel, so you can check us out on YouTube, or I could send you the link, you know, so just reach out to us via the website, or you can WhatsApp me. All right, so that's it. All right, ladies, thank you and have a great evening and a wonderful week.